Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. We hope you enjoy listening to this podcast of St. Louis on the Air, brought to you by University College at Washington University. With undergraduate and graduate programs, part-time, evening, and online. University College at Washington University, offering world-class education within reach. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. President Trump has come and gone from Granite City in the Metro East. We'll go behind the headlines. Our political reporter, Jason Rosenbaum, was there when the president was greeted by a receptive crowd of steelworkers who are clearly happy with the presidential tariff actions that put them back to work. Jason joins us now in studio. Welcome, Mr. Rosenbaum. Welcome, and I'm always glad to talk about anything Illinois-related. As an Illinois native, it's great to reveal the fact that I have Illinois values. We all do. And we try to talk about Illinois as much you as we can. You have Illinois values? You know, of course I do. Oh. I had to go through Illinois to get to Missouri, right? Fair enough. Yeah. All right. It appears from what I've seen and what I've read that the uh, president hit something of a home run yesterday in Granite City. I, I don't want to make that determination, but I do think that a lot of steel workers at the Granite City Works were happy to see him. Uh, whether or not the tariffs were responsible for opening up the, the blast furnaces or not, there's a consensus that if they stay in place— it will lead to more business being uh, flown through that area and, and, and more stability for, for their jobs. The idea being that if there's cheaper imports of steel or aluminum from other countries, then that will lower the demand for American-made steel or aluminum. If you put a tariff there, maybe there's more companies that want to buy American steel or aluminum. And I think that they're they're generally happy about that, but the the converse of that is country, other countries retaliated against the United States and put other tariffs on commodities, like like agriculture commodities and manufactured products. And I think that there's some, some concern, very big concern, about what the effect on individual farmers and, and some manufacturers are going to be. Well, there were some farmers in the area yesterday, and particularly soybean farmers. They're looking at about a 20 percent drop in, uh, in what they're getting for soybeans. So that's a big problem for them. It's kind of a good news on one side, bad news on the other. I think the hope of, of people that support President Trump, especially who are in elected office, that these, this temporary pain will lead to better trade deals in the long run. It, it remains to be seen, though, if a country like China is going with a billion plus people and a lot of leverage to do what it's do what it wants, is really going to be moved to to do something else. Apparently, the president said yesterday that he and the leader of China are good friends and he likes what he's doing. Generally, maybe that leads to something. I, who knows? It's a, it's stranger things have happened. I'm I'm just I'm just not that optimistic based off based off the way the two countries are structured, that that's going to happen. And that's not going to be good for soybean farmers. Well, whatever happens, a lot of people are going back to work in October, effective in October when that second furnace uh, gets rolling. I, and I think, and I've actually spent a lot of time in Granite City um, post-college. One of my friends is from there. And I, I, it's not hard to realize that when you shut down some of those blast furnaces, how devastating that's going to be yeah. for an economy like Granite City. And you do feel good for the steel workers that may have lost their jobs when those blast furnaces closes or may have been able to get a job because they're opening. Like it's a genuinely good thing for their, their lives that they're gonna be having jobs that are gonna pay them well and and give them something to do. Um, the the question though is like how the retaliation from the other countries is ultimately gonna affect their their livelihoods, um, especially if it has a broader impact on the economy that is negative. Obviously, the GDP numbers came out, I think it was like a 4.1% yeah. today, which is good. But we'll just have to see how these tariffs end up affecting the overall economy. If you look back in history, when some tariffs were put into place, sometimes they have a pretty negative effect, especially in the 1920s near the, the Great uh, Depression. Obviously, the economy is changed just a little bit since then. Sure. Talk about the president's demeanor in front of a crowd like that. We, we see on a lot of occasions where he'll go to talk about something serious like tariffs and, and policy issues, but it turns into more of a campaign rally than anything else. 
Boy, that that's a great question. Um, I, this is the second time I've seen Donald Trump speak. Mm. Um, I saw him speak as a candidate, and this was the first time I saw him speak as president. Really, the best way I can describe it is this. Yes, he may be there on a specific issue, but then there's just sidebar after sidebar on a host of different things that he has run into controversy for, whether it be his meeting with Russia or the North Korean leaders or how the media portrays him. Uh, he mentioned the, quote, fake news many times. I personally wasn't offended by that because I was kind of expecting it. And I guess the I, I guess that's made him appealing to some segments of the American electorate. I mean, even though he lost the popular vote, he still ended up getting tens of millions of votes throughout the country, including in Missouri. So clearly that has appeal. Um in in this instance, he had a teleprompter, and there were points in the speech he was clearly reading off the teleprompter, mm-hmm. but there were also points in the speech he clearly was ad-libbing. And it's it's definitely different from most politicians that I've seen, but it also makes it just incredibly hard to follow and difficult for a journalist to digest everything, which may be the point, but I, I don't know if he's doing that with that in mind. It's just the effect that occurs. You can really hear in his voice when he's reading from the prompter and when he's not. I mean, there's a different tone, a different pace, a different rhythm to his speech. Yeah, I think so. And the other thing I noticed, too, is he's just continually obsessed with the 2016 election and the and the results. Yeah. And the, the election is obviously still in the news because of Russia's interference. But after a while, that's going to become more distant and distant from people's memories. And What's going to become closer and closer is his re-election bid in 2020. And I think continuously bringing up the fact that he won that election or that it was unfair that his election is being mitigated as not valid by some people, you know, maybe it plays to the crowd. But I actually think that plays the crowd less than maybe some of the actual issues that affect people's lives. I mean, there's always focus on the 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 verbosity of Donald Trump. But in this instance, with the tariffs, the tariffs actually affect people's lives. Mm-hmm. In, in one hand, on one hand, it may end up helping steel and aluminum manufacturers in the long run, but it may end up hurting farmers to the point where they can't be in business anymore if there's no relief there. So I, I, I don't want to try to say that the, the zaniness of politics isn't important. It obviously is, because with Donald Trump, he could say something incendiary at any time. But in this instance, I actually think the policy he was talking about is quite important to people. And I, I think it was notable that he gave a rigorous defense of, of tariffs. Not surprising, though. Interestingly, though, if it if it hurts farmers as, as badly as it could, uh, that's a big part of his base. And that could have a significant influence on voting in November and in 20. And especially in the Missouri Senate race. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill has often done better among rural voters than than other Democratic statewide officials. In 2006, in particular, if you look at the map, and granted, it was a different electorate back then, but back then she won a whole bunch of rural counties. And she won even more rural counties in 2012 when Todd Aiken imploded. So now we're at a situation after 2016 where Democratic statewide officials, including ones like Chris Coster and Jason Kander, who did pretty well considering Trump's coattails, still lost a lot of rural counties by 20 and 30 percentage points. It's clear that's not sustainable for a Democrat to win statewide. I'm sure it's possible, but it would be a very narrow victory. So I think what McCaskill is doing is using this tariff issue as a way to tell rural voters and tell farmers that I'm on your side here. This is an issue that affects your life. And if you keep me in the Senate, you know, I'm going to be on your I'm going to be in your corner. And that may be enough to compel some of the rural voters to get to that 35 to 40 percent margin that she needs, along with winning the suburbs and winning big in the urban areas. Well, there were three uh, Illinois congressmen in the audience yesterday who are probably scratching their heads a little bit because they represent uh, largely rural areas, and they got a lot of farmers in their constituency. Uh, they do. I think uh, U.S. Representative Mike Boss, though, and that was his district, I'm pretty sure. It is. I, I think that he's been pretty adamant about the tariffs for a while, and I, mm. I'm sure that Brendan Kelly, his Democratic opponent, may have not, not have taken the exact same tack, because I think he has the, actually the endorsement of the, the Steelworkers Union, but I mean, they have to cater to various constituencies in that particular district, because yes, it is agricultural, but it also still has some manufacturing in it. 
John Shimkus is not going to face a competitive election. His district is incredibly Republican. Mm -hmm. Rodney Davis, though, I think is kind of in a, a difficult position where most of his district is farmland. And he told me personally that, yeah, he is getting a lot of feedback from his sure. farmers that are not super positive about this tariffs. I think he's pointing to certain deals with the EU that may end up helping them. But I go back to if China and Canada and Mexico don't budge, is the EU doing what it did this week really going to matter in the long run? Like, I think it remains to be seen whether these tariffs can actually lead to better trade deals. I, I think mm -hmm. that the time will tell, but I, I, I'm not super optimistic on that front. I, I'd like to go behind the scenes a little bit with you, mm -hmm. who was there, there yesterday. You mentioned the fake news uh, charge that he makes every time he speaks, it yeah. seems. Uh, you had an opportunity to talk to people. Were the people affected by that? How did, how did the people react to the, the media? You know, I actually looked at the crowd when he did that for the first time, and some of them were, like, applauding I'm sure there were some boos there, but some of them were waving at us. Um, I talked to quite a few people before the rally started, including some steel workers and some political people, and they couldn't have been nicer. Like, I think that they were happy to tell us about their opinion about the tariffs and about how they affect agriculture and how uh, the tariffs might affect their livelihood. I mean, how they might affect Granite City. Mm -hmm. Joe, Joe Manis, who was also there, I think generally experienced the same thing inside. Um, clearly, there are always going to be people at a crowd that are going to be more hostile to you than others. But I just am, I just am hesitant to paint the crowd with a broad brush when sure. my experience with them was generally pretty positive. But it's just part of, like, the president's shtick. And attacking the media has been kind of part and parcel with politicians for a while. I will say that Trump is taking it to a a very extreme level that's very concerning when it comes to accountability. Obviously, there was that situation where the White House press secretary didn't allow a CNN reporter to report on an open press event, which is, you know, frankly outrageous. Mm -hmm. I, if, if something happened like that here in Missouri with a governor, that would be unprecedented too. And I think that I would be the loudest person saying that that's not right. So I'm not trying to say that some of the things that Trump has said about the press is not alarming, because it is. And I'm not saying it hasn't had an effect on how people look at the media, because it has. I'm just saying in this particular instance, even though he used the fake news epitaph a bunch of times, I, I wouldn't say that the people there were particularly hostile in inside the building. What about outside? Did you have a chance to interact with the protesters? Not, not really, because no. the thing that you had to do to get to uh, the rally was you had to get on these very nice air-conditioned buses. And then once you got on the buses and into the steel mill, you really didn't have a chance to get out of it once you once you were there. I I think that I do I do know that our I do think that there were both pro and con people. I think mm. Grant City is a little bit more remote than some Trump rallies, like say in downtown St. Louis or suburban St. Charles. Mm. I wouldn't say it's super remote. You I got there with the twenty minutes without too much of uh, too much of a problem. But, um, you know, I didn't really get a much chance to interact with people because I had to go in and talk with people inside. Uh, Ivanka Trump was with her father, uh, and she spoke, I understand. I, I haven't seen anything quoted in the, in the papers uh, about anything she had to say. She spoke for maybe a minute oh. and basically said, thank you. You know, the Trump administration is, is working for you, and I'm glad to be here. It wasn't anything terribly substantial, but it was notable that she was in attendance. Um, but I think the vast majority of verbiage was from the president. Mm. Again, I want to go behind the scenes for the couple of minutes that we have left. Um, you just don't walk into a presidential event. I mean, you have to be credentialed. You have to be uh, looked over by the Secret Service. What did you have to go through to, to cover this? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to sign up on a form saying you want to cover the event. And I think all, all everybody who signed up on St. Louis Public Radio's front got credentials pretty, pretty easily. It took a couple days. Then you got to go on the bus. They check off your name. And then you have to stand in line and go through Secret Service. Like they have to, you know, dog sniff your, your equipment. You have to be, like, wanted. And this was pretty much the same thing with a Democratic administration, too. This is not a Trump thing. I want to make that clear. Then you're kind of in this area where there's tables, there's places to plug in your computer, there's risers to take photos or to shoot video. Um, you can't really go beyond that barrier, but the barrier was very close to the crowd. So you could, like, literally, like, 
say, hey, I want to talk with you about this. And they either say yes or no. And it was very hot in there. We had to wait for about three hours. I had to wait for about three hours. Yeah. But that really gave me a lot of time to talk with people and transcribe and work. And um, yesterday I had to do an awful lot of radio work for both us and National NPR. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of that had to be done on the scene. So that's kind of a hyper-specific look into what it takes to cover that type of thing. It is always kind of exciting to to cover vice president mm-hmm. or president, but it is a lot of work and it can be very tiring at the end of the day just because there's a lot of waiting and a lot of security and a lot of a lot of precautions. But that's pretty much been the same way for any president for the last couple of decades or so. What about interaction with the Secret Service? Um, I, I think that there were a couple of instances where I assume was either security or Secret Service like told me like where the bathroom was or you know uh, where to go, and they were all very friendly, mm-hmm. and they and they they were not obtrusive at all. Do you have any sense of the other kind of security? I know, and and those similar events that I've covered, they have to sweep the area uh, yeah. to make sure there are no bombs or, or things that shouldn't be there whenever a president arrives. My understanding is that a lot of TV people come very early and set up their cameras yeah. there. And I think that's – then they have to leave for a couple of hours and then you come back. In in my instance, since I only had radio equipment and a laptop, I don't think that would really fall into that category. When I got there, there were already tons of media people there. At any time the president comes somewhere, there was probably at least – I think there had to be like 75 or 125 reporters there from all over the country um, and from all over the region and from all over the state because, you know, it was a big deal for Illinois – Um, probably more reporters than covering the vice president's speech last week. But, you know, it was it was definitely an interesting experience. And I actually think the 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 highlight for me was talking with the steelworkers and hearing hearing how this this, these policies will affect them and affect farmers. Like that was actually the most enjoyable thing for me about it. Um, You know, seeing the president speak was also something that I can tell my kids about, but I've seen presidents speak before. I don't want to seem like an old fogey, but uh-huh. this is not my first rodeo there. Uh, well, uh, we only have a, a little bit of time left. The president, I think I read, spoke for maybe 50 minutes. Yeah. How much of your time was devoted to that 50 minutes in terms of getting there and finally finishing what you had to do? You mean total? Yeah. Uh, I left at 11, 11 o'clock in the morning. I l- ended up leaving the event maybe around 425 and I finished up all my work by about 630. So I think about a total of about seven or eight hours. Um, And, you know, even while the president was making his speech still, like I had a pretty hard deadline. So I was still listening to him, but I was also cutting audio while he was still speaking, (laughs) if you want me to be completely candid with you. Um, Because, yeah, you got to listen to what the president says. You have to be on the lookout for him to say something like, internationally newsworthy, but as soon as he was about to say goodbye to people, I was like, I need to get to work. Yeah. So And that's tough when he's extemporaneous for part of the time. Yeah, it yeah. is, but it's it's part of it's part of the job. Part of the job, Jason Rosenbaum, and what a good job you do. Thank you so much for being with us. Great to talk to you as always. Thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, ninety point seven KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.